ton of men and women wrestled in WCW rings over the course of its history, and at one point, it felt like the company had over 9,000 people on their active roster. So while you had legends like Ric Flair, Sting, Goldberg, Scott Steiner, and Perry Saturn enthralling audiences the world over, you also had a lot of bone benders who blended into the background and have, in many ways, been forgotten about. And I am not about to stand back and let that happen, for Kiwi's sake. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WCW wrestlers you don't remember. Let's get ready to reminisce! Number 10, Firebreaker Chip. Early 90s WCW was a real mishmash of good, bad, and some of the most ridiculous bollocks you've ever seen in wrestling. Some of the actual wrestling was truly exceptional, but a lot of the gimmicks were duds and showed why the company was in such a rotten slump before Eric Bischoff took the reins in the middle of the decade. One of the many crap tag teams from that time were the WCW Patriots, which comprised of Todd Champion, Gulf War veteran, and Firebreaker Chip, Fireman. God bless our men in uniform. Chip was portrayed by Curtis Thompson, a compact ball of muscle who had been working for a few years on the independent scene and in Puerto Rico. As part of the gimmick, he wore a fireman's helmet and looked every bit the low-rent Chippendale with his greased-up physique and suspenders. Special Forces had a couple of feuds with the likes of the fabulous Freebirds and Young Pistols, but didn't achieve much success. Their biggest match was probably their unsuccessful tag team title match with the Enforcers at Halloween Havoc 91. One of the most notable aspects of Thompson's WCW run was not anything that happened in the ring, but his backstage fight with Diamond Dallas Page at a house show. Number 9. Hard Work Bobby Walker Hard Work Bobby Walker was around in WCW for the best part of a decade and, in that time, managed to do almost nothing memorable. Injuries didn't help, but the truth is that WCW didn't position Walker, who had worked for Japan's FMW, did some enhancement matches for WWE, and trained at the power plant as anything more than a jobber to the stars. His best year was probably 1996, as he wrestled his largest amount of yearly matches, 25, and got televised victories over the likes of Billy Kidman, Mr. LJ, and Brad Armstrong. WCW even gave him Teddy Long to act as his mouthpiece, but he didn't exactly receive a big push on the back of it. Walker was charismatic and athletic, but never given a storyline or anything substantial to work with. In the end, he was just one of many on a bloated WCW roster at the time. Post-WCW, however, he caused lots of headaches for them, and later WWE, who inherited some of WCW's legal mess, when he, along with others including Sonny Ono, filed a racial discrimination lawsuit against the company. Number 8. Reno a former amateur wrestler and professional kickboxer, Richard Cornell was one of many hopefuls who received their pro wrestling education at the infamous WCW power plant in the late 90s. It made sense then for him to join up with a bunch of his fellow power plant graduates in the Natural Born Thrillers stable. The man with the ponytail took a bit of a backseat to hot prospects like Sean O'Hare and Mark Jindrak, but he did find success in the company's hardcore division, holding the title for a month between October and November 2000. While Reno had a unique look and received a little bit of a push, he just didn't yet have the tools to pull it all off. Outside of his admittedly great roll the dice finisher, his wrestling style was basic and unpolished. It also didn't help his cause that WCW was a creative wasteland around this time and people were tuning out in their droves. WWE felt like he had some potential and bought his contract out when they acquired WCW, but he never made it past developmental, was released and then left the business soon after. Number 7. Joe Gomez I know what you're thinking, how could I forget somebody with such a ridiculously good head of hair? Gomez started in WCW in 1990, wrestling as Alan Iron Eagle and losing to just about everybody before leaving the company and resurfacing later in the decade. In 1996, Gomez came back and got something of a mini push teaming with other generic uncharismatic performers like Mark Starr and Jim Powers in a brief feud with the Dungeon of Doom. I mean, I suppose when you fail to eradicate the mighty Hulk Hogan from the face of existence, the next logical step is to go after Gomez, Powers, and Star, right? While the New World Order was running rampant, the crew of Jabronis also got into a dispute with the Horsemen, and Gomez even wrestled and lost to Steve Mongo McMichael at Bash at the Beach. WCW soon lost interest in Gomez, and he was moved down the card, forming a loser tag team with the Renegade. 
He did go out on a high, mind you, beating The Gambler on an April 1999 episode of WCW Saturday Nights. Number 6. Swole A former NFL player and a trainee of Brad Reingans, who had also had a hand in coaching Brock Lesnar prior to him starting in WWE Developmental Territory OVW, Randy Thornton's career began with brief stints in the AWA in New Japan in the early 90s. He finally received his big break in 1999 when he got a gig with WCW thanks to his friendship with real-life friend rap superstar Master P, who was then with the company as the leader of the No Limit Soldiers. Thornton joined the soldiers as the group's muscle, hence the apt name of Swole. The NLS primarily feuded with the West Texas Rednecks in a country music versus rap rivalry, but Swole himself only wrestled in a handful of tag matches, including at that year's Bash at the Beach pay-per-view. Swole was a brawler who lacked finesse and was noted for his palm thrust finisher, but he wasn't around for the long term. After the feud with the West Texas Rednecks ended, Thornton left WCW and retired from the business. Number 5. Yoshi Kwan Another case of a talented wrestler being saddled with a terrible, and in this case highly offensive and downright racist, gimmick. A Kentucky-born Florida resident and student of the Malencos, Chris Champion had a decent run in the 80s and early 90s working for groups like Championship Wrestling from Florida, Mid-Atlantic and the USWA before finding his way to Ted Turner's organization in 93. Not as Chris Champion though, but as Yoshi Kwan, a stereotypical sneaky Asian heel. Was it China or Hong Kong? WCW never did decide. He was managed by Harley Race in his attempt to rid WCW of Cactus Jack. With his garish mullet and over-the-top fake eyebrows, Quan turned heads with his appearance, but he didn't stick around long enough or have good enough matches to make too much of an impression. After losing to Cactus Jack at Fall Brawl, he was put on the sidelines with a knee injury and never did return. He passed away in 2019 at the age of 57. Number 4. Kendall Windham it can be hard for some members of famous wrestling families to live up to the legacy and carry on the name. Son of Hall of Famer Black Jack Mulligan and brother to Hall of Famer Barry Windham, Kendall Windham had the size and surname but sadly lacked the charisma or ring nous to get halfway as far as they did. A veteran who had worked for All Japan as well as various American territories in the 80s, Kendall was used by WCW as little more than a glorified jobber, losing to, in 1998 alone, the likes of Jim Duggan, Jim Neidhart, Finley, and even the lowly Kenny Chaos, among many others. His career received a boost the following year when he partnered up with brother Barry, Kurt Hennig, and Bobby Duncan Jr. in the West Texas Rednecks, and he briefly held the tag team titles with Big Baz. He left WCW late in the year and bounced around from here to there before calling it a day in 2002. Though some would say he didn't fulfill his potential, Kendall's own father admitted in an interview that he wasn't gifted with the it factor in the way that Barry was and actually overachieved considering his limited physical abilities and personality. Number 3. Braun the Leprechaun Seeing that name written down makes me sad that we never got to see Strowman morph into a 7 foot hornswoggle, you know? It also makes me sad because it means that I have to think and talk about Braun the Leprechaun, an ungodly WCW creation portrayed by Dwayne Bruce. Bruce had worked for WCW since the late 80s as an undercard talent, most notably as Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker in the NAF Tag Team State Patrol. He was repackaged as the woeful Braun the Leprechaun in the summer of 1996, managed by Jimmy Hart as a member of the Dungeon of Doom. Seeing him run around and scream while pretending to be the folkloric Irish creature, while the ultra-cool NWO were kicking ass and taking names at the same time, really showed the strange dichotomy of WCW at the time. The company thankfully realized it wasn't working and canned it before too long. Bruce then wrestled sporadically while working as the head trainer of the power plant. As seen during his appearance on Louis Theroux's Weird Weekend, Sarge, as he was known, clearly had a massive small man complex. Which leads me to think that the whole leprechaun thing may have been a rib. That'll teach you to mess with Waldo. Number 2. Emery Hale you can see what WCW believed they had in Emery Hale the moment you lay eyes on him. The guy was massive, and during an era where those with larger-than-life physiques got opportunities despite lacking in other areas, Hale got an opportunity on the big stage. Our Hale was a monster, but strangely, or perhaps not so strangely since this is WCW, the company didn't book him as such. 
Instead, his first handful of televised matches were quick squash losses to Van Hammer, Lex Luger, Barry Windham, Booker T, Hugh Morris, and Mike Enos. He disappeared and re-emerged a year later in a mask as The Machine, but again lost, this time to Diamond Dallas Page. Worse than that, Hale, who was managed by Jimmy Hart, looked completely out of his depth and mistimed a crotch spot move so badly that it probably sealed his fate with higher-ups. WCW persisted for a little longer, giving him as Hale a few squash match victories over nobodies on the barely watched Saturday night and worldwide shows. He left WCW later that year and sadly passed away from kidney failure in 2006 at the age of just 36. Number 1. Loch Ness We've seen lots of British wrestlers penetrate the American mainstream over the years, from Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy Smith to William Regal and Wade Barrett, but few experience the type of fame in this country like Giant Haystacks. He, along with Big Daddy, were huge stars in the 70s and 80s, back when World of Sport ruled the airwaves. Haystacks also worked for Stampede Wrestling and All Japan in his prime, but by the time he showed up in WCW in 1996, it was clear for all to see that his best days were long behind him. Renamed Loch Ness, Haystacks was brought in as a member of the Dungeon of Doom for a month in early 1996 and wrestled a handful of matches, including his last ever against the Giants at that year's disastrous uncensored pay-per-view. Looking like a relic from a bygone era, it was sad to watch the gargantuan legend struggle out there. He retired soon after when it was discovered that he was ill, and sadly he passed away just a couple of years later at the age of 52.